wanted to do something. And this is real short. Turn me down just a little bit, guys. Actually, I got this from a friend uh, back a while ago. And he had attended, turn this down just a little bit more so we can get rid of that mid-range ring. Actually, he had gone to Asbury. You ever heard of Asbury Theological? And he's been a friend for a long time. And um, he had actually gotten this from his, uh, one of his professors. And it's called a reflection on Psalm 150 which says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. All right. What I would like for you to do, guys, turn this down just a whisker more, please. Just a whisker more. I'll compensate up here. I'm going, every time I say, when everything that has breath, I want you to go, and I'll cue you, praise the Lord. All right. Let's, let's uh, run it around once. I'll say, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Good job, this side. All right, everybody did pretty good here. Let's try that, see what happens. All right, here we go. We're going to get into this, and then I'm going to preach, but it's going to be a short, what is that? Uh, I didn't take Spanish. Un poquito? Is, did I say it right? Un, un Okay. I'm trying to be I'm trying to be versatile with my languages. I'm still working on English. All right. Here we go from Psalm 150. <clears throat> Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. a command, but surely not an order. This holy urging is like bidding a rabbit to race, a songbird to sing. Let everything that has breath Stop the rivers flowing, stop the winds warm blowing, and you can stop the creatures showing that the goal towards which they're growing is to let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now such an end to the psalm surprises us. This book of 150 prayer songs begins, blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. So we might have expected to hear, let everything that has breath obey the Lord. But no, the Holy One, blessed be he, says instead, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Not that we are to disobey, nor that the Father wills anything but our loving obedience, for to obey is better than sacrifice. But the word given here instead is, let everything that has breath we might have thought to read, trust the Lord, for it is written, blessed is the one who makes the Lord his trust. But at the end of the word, it says, let everything that has breath. It may take us by surprise not to see on the Psalter's final page the reminder to hear the Lord or see the Lord or worship the Lord or proclaim the Lord. But assuming all of these at the end, instead God tells us, let everything that has breath, but we may think to say, we're too weak to praise the Lord. That is for the strong. No, the word doesn't say, let everything that is strong praise the Lord, but rather, let everything that has breath, or we may think to say, we are far too strong to praise the Lord. That is for the weak. No, the word says not. Let everything that is weak praise the Lord, but rather let everything that has breath. Or we may think to say we are too profound to praise the Lord. That is for the simple. No, the word doesn't say let everything that is simple praise the Lord, but rather let everything that has breath. Some may even think to say we are too rich to praise the Lord. That's for the poor. Or we are too poor to praise the Lord. That is for the rich. No, the word is not let everything that is rich or poor praise the Lord, but let everything that has breath. Too hungry to praise the Lord? Do you have breath? Too full? Do you have breath? 
too free to praise the Lord? Do you have breath too bound? Do you have breath too old, too young? Do you have breath too blessed, too bereft, too handsome, too plain? Do you have breath too slow, too swift, too bold, too shy, too sick, too healthy, too lame, too limber? Hear the word of the Lord as it says, let everything that has breath praise whom? Not to be confused with the king. There is a time and a place to revere the king, a time to let him do his thing, and then applaud and rise and sing the nation's anthem, let it ring. But that's a different song than this, and he's a different one than this. So hear the word and note the one of whom it is said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The Lord. Not to be confused with saints of any age whose lives deserve great praise. In them the Lord's own greatness shines. Their very broken lives enshrain the power of one who dwells with them, who loves in them. We rise up in the gate and call her blessed in honor preferring one another. That's one thing. This is another. So hear the word of God spoke again. Let everything that has breath Verse 1 names a place to praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. True. But where do we go that we don't breathe? Let everything that has breath. We go and come and do and work and be in other places that are not his designated house. Yes, but where do we go that we don't breathe? Hear the word of the Lord again. Let everything that has breath. Verse 2 gives reason to praise the Lord. Praise God for his mighty deeds. But we're often too slow to see his mighty deeds. True, but we are rarely slow to breathe. So let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Again, it says, praise him for his greatness. We may forget his greatness, but we never forget to breathe. So. Let everything that has breath. Verse 3 names instruments to whom sound we can praise the Lord. The triumphant blast of the trumpet, the plaintive flow of the flute, the rippling arpeggios of the harp, and so on in verses 4 and 5. The choreography of joyful dance with tinkling timbrel and crashing cymbal. But I don't own a harp. Do you breathe? My fingers are foreigners to its strings. Do you breathe? I can't dance by faintest chance. Do you breathe? I can't even carry a tune, let alone a trumpet. Then join with those who can and do and will. But can you breathe? If so, hear the word again. Let everything that has breath breathe. all breathe. All breathe. Everything that breathes, everything. That is, praise the Lord with the wag of the puppy dog's tail. Praise God with the arch of the golden eagle's sail. Praise the Lord with the leap of leopard and lynx, the ox, the ass, the elephant and its trunk, the fox, the bass, the elegant and the skunk. With fur, with fin, with beak, with bill, with claw and paw, with quack, with quill, with wing, with web, with tail, without. The last line of the sh psalm shouts out, let everything that has breath. We both made it. Praise God. That was great. I love that. Praise the Lord. God does what he wants. He really does. He puts things together. You know, I may spend a few hours each week to put it together. But it's like we used to say, I would be on the phone every day, and we had an agent that helped us out and worked with us on booking. But the, 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 the little thing I would say was, we make the phone calls, but God makes the bookings. That's the way that plays out. And that refers to this morning, I have a, a, a theme. It's going to be a short message this morning in which everybody goes, finally. And Tim, though, he brought in prayer, and, and, and Corey, when he, he mentioned prayer as well, I didn't, you know, Tim had my, my sermon title, 
as it were. And but but Corey didn't know. But God knows what He wants. He's got something. Remember, I said last week that you know these aren't just things I pull from the vault. I don't I don't just pull from the vault. Everything is fresh out of the crate. You know, it's brand spanking new, and it's something that God has laid on my heart. And this, it's not it's not deep deep, but it's what I think that God wants us to be impressed with, and it's it's basically if you if you don't believe, don't expect an answer. That's simple enough, is it? You know, if you're not going to be if you're not going to be invested, why bother? God, God's not interested in in our half-hearted, you know, moseying up to Him and saying, "How you doing? Hope you're having a good day." He wants us because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And that's what prayer is all about. Our text this morning comes from Mark chapter 11, verse 24. It should be flying up here any moment. And part of that verse, the part that I'm using, it says, all things for which you pray, ask, that's a key word, ask, believe that you have received them. And they shall be granted you. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, uh, I ask your anointing this morning. I ask your blessing on the preparation of this word. And Father, I ask that the, the promise that you've given is that when your word goes out, and that's what we want to happen, the, the word to go out, that it's not going to come back to the recipient Void. It's not going to come back empty. And that the recipient, as it, that person lives their lives, they will invest the word. They will incorporate the word into their lives, so it becomes uh, not just part of their 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 mentality, but it will become part of our lives. We will live the word. So help us to do that this morning, Father. In in Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. I love this verse. I really do. It's not one of my life's verses. It's not one of my go-to verses, but I'm familiar with it. And and but I think that that we take what it says for granted. We really do. When you pray, believe that you've received it, and it will be granted to you. Now, I like what uh, I think Tim said it that that when. He referred to it. When God places something in our heart, the, the word changes us. Prayer changes us. It, we shouldn't be praying with the hopes that we're going to turn God's head. We're not, we don't pray with the hopes that, well, God has his best will in mind. But if we pray, then God's going to change it to something other than his best will. I always kind of use that thought when, it's got nothing to do with prayer, but, you know, when God created man, uh, Adam, in the, in the Garden of Eden, you know, God made a, a physical body, right? He made a physical body, he made a nose and ears and all of that. And, and what God made for him, and you and I are the, the recipients of that, it wasn't God's second-rate idea to house Adam's spirit until God had a better idea. You get that? Your body is not a second-rate idea. That's why when we talk about the new earth, we talk about being, you know, living forever, that we're not just some spirits floating around, you know, with some kind of harp in our hand, you know, playing it forever like the Far Side cartoon. Again, I've said it before, wishing forever and ever and ever and ever that we had brought a magazine. You know, that's not that. But we'll have bodies, and bodies need certain things. Okay, that's a sidebar. I'm, I'm off that. We don't pray to change God's mind. God didn't have a premium top shelf idea for our bodies uh, until he had a better idea. God doesn't work that way. God works top shelf all the time, every time. And so when we pray, there's, there's, a, there's a method to all this. We'll talk about this for a moment here. Uh, we can't take it for granted. When we're talking to God, don't take it for granted. Like this, I talked to a biker one. He had been a biker. 
and he was at a drug rehab center. And I remember sitting down talking with him. It was over, I think it was in also in Minneapolis. We sat in the front after church, and, and uh, you know, we were just talking. He was a big guy. I mean, his arms were as big as my thighs. You know, he was this guy, and he had been in prison a few times. And, and these were prison arms. We call them prison arms, right? And they're just huge. And he, and he had ink all over him, you know, and he was tatted up. And, and he said, yeah, when I get to heaven, and already I, I think I started to snicker, you know, inside. He said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a talk with the old boy. Now, I, I, I try to be reserved. I try to have, you know, I try to have boundaries, and usually I do, but I like to have fun, too. I do. We get, so, we get so tight. We really do. And you can tell I'm, I'm, I'm almost, well, I'm, I, I'm not going to say it. But, <laughs> I, I, but I had to stop. I, I, I couldn't be reserved when he said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a talk with the old boy. And I just looked at him. I said, no, you ain't. He said, what do you mean? I said, because if you get to heaven, I said, you're not doing any talking at all. I said, God is going to be the one that does all the talking. He's going to be all the, do all the talking. We take so many things for granted when we approach the Father. He's approachable, right? Remember that word, Abba, right? Which means what? Daddy, Father, Daddy, in the, in the most informal sense of the word daddy right the english word and god gives us free access to him the creator of everything everything without him was not anything made that was made in the book of john first chapter right off the right off the bat he made everything and what i think it's colossians that by him all things consist. He holds it all together. When you approach God, God says, come to me. Jesus said, come to me, all of you that labor and are what? And I'll give you what? I'll give you rest. That's what the God of the universe says. But we don't want to take that for granted. And sometimes we miss the deeper implications and practical application that comes out of this passage right here. You see, as we look at the verse, we'll just do a, a, little, a little taking it apart for a moment. The first thing that we find the Lord issuing, it's a command. It's a command. There's, there's that imperative sense to this. In the original language, it's imperative. Do this. It's not a suggestion or it's, I, I hope you do this. It's an imper it's a command to do this. And what is it what is it that we're commanding to do? Here's the word pisteo. That's the Greek word or you can say it slowly pisteo. And that word means to believe. It means to believe. And and it's a command to believe like a you know being in the Navy, you hear a, a superior officer telling you to do, telling you, it's imperative, do this. And if you learn to obey, it can save your life, if you obey. And it's a command to pasteo, believe, to believe. And it's more than just, I believe, yeah, I believe you, sure, I believe you. It's, it's a command to fully trust, to fully be invested, to, be, to fully have confidence, have complete assurance. But there's a deeper part to this, this. It means to both believe, it means to be faithful to what you believe, to be fully invested, to live your belief. An example, if I were to say to you, just standing up here, the building's on fire. Everybody leave right now. It's not very convincing. And you might go, yeah, it's good to get out of church early today. You know, as you sit there and 
you go shake some hands before you, you escape out of the burning building. Did I leave anything in the children's church? Hmm, maybe I should grab that before I escape. But if I say, the building is on fire, leave now. Instead of thinking, all of a sudden, you smell smoke. And then from under your chair, there's heat. And there's fire licking out at the floors because it's burning this wooden floor. Then all of a sudden, things change. You become fully invested. You start living your belief. I'm getting out of here now, right this moment. Like, I heard this story, maybe you've heard it before, where a guy out in the Midwest, Nebraska, the way the story goes, there's a drought, and it's been there for a few weeks. Grass is, gr uh, is dying. Crops are dying. Cattle are dying because there's no water. And, and even the, 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 the rivers are just now rock beds. But there's no water. And so the pastor says, he said, we're going to have a prayer meeting. We're going to pray for water. Come back tonight. So all the church comes back at night, and he looks out at the congregation, and he says, you might as well all go home, except for that little boy right there. He and I are going to pray. And somebody from the congregation said, why is he staying? He said, because we came to pray, but he's the only one that brought an umbrella. You came to ask God for prayer, but you don't believe enough to br bring an umbrella with you. <laughs> Folks, if we hope to have God answer our prayers, and I'll give you some other verses here to, to give you that imperative thing here. We better believe that he will answer our prayers because if we don't have faith that he will answer, then we better not expect any results. And here's the problem. We get so used to, again, that situational ethics thing. Depending on the situation you're in or, or, or who you're talking to, sometimes makes the difference as to whether you're going to actually keep your word. We don't always keep our word. It's, it becomes an optional thing. Well, I told him I was going to meet him at 2 o'clock, but, you know, 2.30 is okay. He doesn't mind waiting. Situational. Now, if it's somebody important or somebody that you really respect, I told him I was going to meet him there at 2. I got to get going if I'm going to be there at 2. What's the difference? You know, if I've told you I'm going to meet you at 2 o'clock, I, I want to be there. If I've told Mike down here at Unity Acres, who says he's got that third eye thing, he was the same guy the first time I met him. I, we talked for a while. I can say this right now because I said it to his face. We talked for like, you were sitting in the car right there. And I talked to him for like 10 minutes, first time I'd ever spoken with him. And he, I could just, you know, you just, you work with folks for a while, you get an idea. And I said to him, Mike, what kind of drugs do you use? He said, oh, I don't use drugs, Reverend. See, that changes the con conversation when he calls me Reverend. I kind of like that. And so... Oh, I don't use drugs. Well, we spoke for about four more minutes. I got an idea of what to do. I said, when was the last time you used? He said, about a week ago. You get it? I said, what do you use? He said, well, I, I smoked weed yesterday. And he said, I haven't used meth for about a month. I said, how long have you been here? Oh, about three weeks. 
but you smoked weed yesterday. Okay. Anyway, it's another message. <laughs> I was formulating another message right there all of a sudden. I, just, I can't do that. In the book of James, chapter 1, verse 5. The word says, if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Man, right now, I feel like I should go to that other message. I'm not going to, though. Whew. It's saying to us, if you need any wisdom, go ahead and ask God. He'll give it to you. Solomon asked for wisdom, right? And he became, the Bible tells us, the wisest person ever. God, he just asked God for it. But there's a key verse in this passage from James, same chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, should be coming up here. And it's in, just like the verse back in Mark. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is like a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. I'll give you an example of that. I think I've mentioned it before. When our, when our sons were younger, and I think Jer, you know, he being the oldest, was probably the first. I was the designated sliver remover. And, and Jer came up to me at some point, may, I don't know, maybe he was four or something, and he said, Daddy, I have a sliver in my finger. And so I looked at it, and sure enough, it was a sliver. And what do you, what's the normal tool to get a sliver out? Wait, wait, what did everybody say? I got like a tweezers or a needle or, or a what? A pen? Pen, yeah. And so what do you do with a pin? You got to do what first? You got you to gotta clean it up. You got to heat it up. You gotta, I, I, put, uh, I heat it up and I put some alcohol on it. And so, I, you know, he shows me his finger and he sees me coming towards his finger with this needle. And he whines a little bit and he said, Daddy, it's going to hurt. I said, it may, it may sting just a little, but if, if we leave it in there, it could get infected and it'll hurt a lot. So he said, okay. So I go towards, and I just, I don't even touch him, and he pull his hand, pulls his hand away. I said, but you got to keep your hand there. Don't move it. So he gets it there, and I'm kind of firming it up a little bit. And so I get there, and I kind of touch him. He pulls it away again. I said, do you want me to take it out or not? Well, we work it out. We, we get it done. But you see, that's unstable. And the Bible says that that's a person who's double-minded, not knowing whether they're coming or going, whether they want it or not, whether they want your help or not. God is saying to you, do you want me to help you? And if you don't know what you're looking for, then the Bible says that you're, you're confused, you're, you're unstable. And, and the Bible says that man should not think that he would receive anything from the Lord. You know, by the way, it says man, but it means woman too. Mankind. There is a very real condition for answered prayer. You must believe that God will answer. That's it. You got to believe that God will answer. We can't, we can't doubt. We must expect God to answer because there's only one kind of prayer that God answers, and that's the prayer of faith. That's it, right? Again, there's a, there, there's a watermark for for receiving and asking and getting. And Matthew says it this, or, or Jesus said it, Ma Matthew records it, according to your faith, ooh, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. According to your faith. I have prayed so many times, and it's like crickets. I get nothing, or like 
you know, Grandma Griswold used to say back when we were young believers, she'd say there are times that I prayed and it was like my prayers just didn't go any farther than the ceiling of the church. But she'd say I worked it out. I started believing what God was saying to me. Folks, right now, what is it that you're looking for in your life that you believe you need God to come in and, 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 and that dark place of your life? Some, maybe it's, a, I don't know. Jesus pointed out to his disciples on a number of occasions that faith, believing that God would do what they asked was important. I'll give you an example. Jesus had just finished feeding a bunch of people few thousand, just a little get-together. And he fed them with just a, a few Twinkies and a few sardines. His disciples get on the boat. They're going across the lake, and Jesus said, I'll catch up with you. So while they're in the boat, some of these guys are experienced fishermen. Others are not. But a storm comes up. It doesn't say how big it was, but the ship apparently was rolling, and these guys were white-knuckled, hanging onto this, I'm using the term lightly, ship. And they're afraid for their lives. And, and one of the guys says, through the, you know, the wiping the, the water from their eyes, and, and, and the wind's blowing, and they're, they're afraid... They, he looks out and they, I, I see a, I think it's a ghost. Who are we going to call? No, never mind. <laughs> I drank coffee again this morning. Real coffee. I don't drink real coffee. I don't know if it jacks you up, but it jacks me up. You knew about this before I did. You still did it. <laughs> he knows me and he still loves me. He saw, I see a ghost and, and this figure gets closer. And it, it's not a ghost, it's a man. And it, it gets close. And they see it, and it's Jesus. Now instead of you know everybody getting real relaxed, because Jesus had been with them in a boat before. Remember that story? He's in a boat. And what is Jesus doing in that boat? He's sleeping. These other guys are going, and the, the way King James puts, you know, Master, carest thou not that we perish? So Jesus gets up, and, and the way I envision it anyway, it's like he, he looks at these guys, maybe a little disturbed, disappointed that they don't trust that they're going to be okay. Bible's not been written yet, so they don't have the benefit of what we've got. But Jesus is with them. And so Jesus does it. Here's my picture. I, I'm picturing him raising his hands towards the sky and speaking like correcting an unruly child. Be quiet! Be still! And it does. And the Bible says the storm comes. So now they see Jesus and, and these guys... It doesn't appear that they're any more relaxed. And then Jesus says, come out, come out of the boat. Now, we read Peter, come out of the boat. Some theologians believe that Jesus ex extended that, that um, invitation to all these guys. We don't know how many were on this boat. We, we normally assume that all 12 of these guys just hung around with each other like they're connected at the shoulder. May or may not have been that way, but they don't. But then we read Peter come out. So Peter, again, probably white knuckle, lets go of his safe spot. And, and the Bible says that he steps out of the boat. And, and can you imagine, he, he steps on the water, and maybe gingerly, and, but, and it's holding him. Then he puts the other foot out, and the other guys are like, you know, he's doing it, he's doing it, he's doing it. 
and he steps out and he takes a step, then another step. And I think I've said it this way before because this is the way I picture it. And he probably, I'm thinking, he turns around, he goes to the other guys, he's going. Kind of like thinking to himself, boy, are my grandkids going to have a story. But the Bible tells us that at some point he takes his eyes off Jesus. And he begins to what? Begins to sink. And, and we do the same thing, don't we? We do that. God, I'll do what you want me to do. But then at some point, probably like Peter, we go. We feel the waves. We, we feel the wind blowing in our face. It kind of knocks us off our, off our, our, our mission. And then we start to sink because of our faith. And Jesus says these words as he pulls Peter back up out of the water. Matthew 14, 30, uh, 31. Jesus says, and this is again in the NIV, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter, you saw me turn water into wine. I, we don't read this there at that point, but this thought process is there. Jesus knew, Peter knew. You saw me turn water into wine. You, you saw me raise that little girl who was dead. And she's alive with her mom today. You, you saw me mix a little bit of spit with some dirt, and I put it out of man's eyes. And, and he can see you, people that, that had leprosy. I healed them. They're with their families again, not living out in that cave. The guy who was lame, you saw me, you saw me heal these. You've seen me do stuff. And yet, you couldn't keep your eyes on me for just a few seconds more. So you could come right to me. Why did you doubt? Folks, even to this day, doubting kills the wonder of walking with the Creator. The Creator. The Savior. And when we doubt, when we don't have faith, we're the ones that miss the blessing He has for us. How many blessings have you missed? I've missed a bunch. I, and again, I'm humanizing this whole thing, and I, I'm less green-izing. That's the way I put it. I'm less green-izing this, this thought process. Are some of our blessings, are some of the things that God has for us just sitting there in heaven unclaimed? <sighs> because we fail to ask in faith. Could it be that we're struggling, some of us today, physically? maybe in broken families or fractured relationships or wounded spirits because we have failed to ask God in faith. We, we failed to be fully invested, fill, fully, the word we used to use in college, sold out. We sell out to everything else. Why are we sold out to God? And when we talk to him, when we ask him, could, could it be, could it be, no judgments here, I, I have no judgments on any folk, any person here, on our body, on our family here, but could it be that we're not filling more of the seats here in our building because we have failed to ask God in faith to do and to bring about whatever he must do in our lives as his church to reap the harvest? There are almost a thousand people that live right here in in Orwell. I'm not talking about Greater Orwell, but right here in Orwell. There are a few folks that are yet to be impacted by the gospel. There are a few. I'm going to end with this: when we pray for things. In faith, we really please the Savior. Jesus wanted his men to be strong men of faith. 
And he wants us to be strong people of faith today. We're going to do it. Let's do it. If we're not going to do it, let's, let's, let's close the place up. Let's get out of here and go do something else. But if we're going to be invested, let's be fully invested. Lock, stock, and barrel. I've never used that phrase in my whole life. I've said so many things my father used to say for, for the first time right here. Lock, stock, and barrel. I've said it twice now. Whew, I'm on a roll. God desires the same thing, to be people of faith, because it pleases the Lord. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith it's impossible to what? Please God. Faith is believing that God will do it. Faith isn't believing that man, God, God can do it. Faith is believing that God will do it, having complete assurance knowing that whatever he has placed in your heart, that's that thought process earlier. You know, one minute you're saying, God, I believe you could give me a brand new Mercedes convertible. Mike, for my birthday, just a thought. Um. <laughs> Make some, just get your wallet out. He's loaded. He's loaded. <laughs> April's going, no, he's not. No, he's not. She's going, no, he's not. I thought he was, but he's not. <laughs> that's that's inner office stuff. I, I don't care. To... But then one day you're, you're saying, you know, in one part of your life, God, God I, I really... I'd like to win this lottery. I'd like to get this car. I'd like to have this house. But then as you grow in the faith, God starts making an impact in your life. And you're not praying for that new toy any longer. You're now saying, God, I ask that you bless our church in ways that we make an impact in the community. God, I pray for that that family with those kids. They they got they got nothing. Lord, please bless them, won't you? you know, give them all the food they can eat, and you know, Lord, if it's your will, g give those kids some clean clothes. Faith is believing that whatever He places in your heart, He will accomplish, knowing that he will do what he says that he will do, not believing that God can do it, not believing that God might do it, but believing that God will do it. That's why Linda and I are here. You thought we were here just because you voted me in. Well, that's true, too. And I'm glad you did. But we're believing that God wants to do something big here. We believe that. We, bu we bought into it. Not because I'm a great preacher or the money is so good. or It's believing that we're at a place in our lives where we've said, God, we've given this much of our lives to you. We got like that cliche, we got more in back of us than we got in front of us. God, you've had all this, now take all this too. Here's, it's necessary for us to have strong prayer lives. It's necessary for us to have an honest relationship with God. It's necessary for us to have forgiving hearts. Ooh. We've got to believe that God will answer our prayers. And so Jericho flash up on the screen or Jer, whoever's doing it that verse or that part of the verse from Luke 17 5 and it says Lord increase our faith increase our faith 
We need to get the program where we can blow things up, make it big, because that's so very important. That's all I got. Let's pray together.